We're going to be in Luke chapter 24 in our Bibles. Luke chapter 24, if you want to turn there. And if you don't have a Bible but you need one, we would love to give you a free one after the service. We'd love to make sure that you have a Bible before you leave if you don't have one. But we look at the Bible every single week because it's God's Word, really. And my words are all right. You know, they'll help you a little bit, but they won't change people's lives. I can maybe inspire and motivate a little bit, but how do you actually get someone's heart to change? How do you actually get someone's mind to completely change? People know what they should be doing, but oftentimes they don't have the desires to do so. How do you get those desires? We believe that the Word of God actually does that. The Bible tells us that the Word of God actually cuts into the heart, into the bones, and actually radically changes a person. It actually teaches us and shows us the way that we were meant to live. And that's why we open the Word of God every single week. Luke chapter 24 in our Bibles, we will look at the resurrection today. And uh, we're looking at the resurrection of Jesus. That's what Easter is all about. Hey, Easter eggs are fun and bunnies jumping around and all the rest. And candy, I love candy. I already had my fill last night. Had one of those little, what are they called, babe? The little, uh, yeah, Cadbury eggs. Had my Cadbury egg. And they have caramel-filled ones now. They're amazing. Okay, amazing little treats. Uh, You know, but candy and all the rest and Easter egg hunts, these are great. But Easter is really based around Jesus and his resurrection. This whole week has been based around that, starting last Sunday. It's the week of Passover and the Jewish holiday. Jesus was a Jew. Did you know that? He was born in a Jewish town. He was raised in a Jewish family. And he, he spoke in a Jewish language. He ministered to a Jewish people. But he also ministered to the ends of the earth, to everyone else in the world as well. He is the Savior of the world, and we celebrate that today. The title of the message, if you're taking notes, is Our Greatest Need. Our Greatest Need. One Easter, a pastor and a taxi driver both died and went to heaven. True story. And uh, St. Peter, there he was standing at the pearly gates waiting for them. And St. Peter says to the taxi driver, taxi driver, come with me. The taxi driver did as he was told and followed St. Peter to a mansion. It had everything that you could imagine from the bowling alley to Olympic-sized pool. And oh my, this is amazing. The taxi driver says, thank you. Next, uh, St. Peter went to the pastor And he said, Pastor, come this way. I want to show you uh, your place. And he pulls up to a rough old shack with a bunk bed and a little old television, bunny ears and everything. And he says, wait, I think you're a little mixed up, said the pastor. Shouldn't I be the one who gets the mansion? After all, I was a pastor and I went to church every day and, and preached God's word. And Peter says, yes, that's true. But during your Easter sermons, people slept. And when the taxi driver drove, people prayed. What is our greatest need? Think about it. Is it air? Water? Food? We got great food here in LA, huh? The best. Good food? What is our greatest need? What is the greatest challenge in human history? What is the one thing humans can't seem to escape? You know what it is? No human can escape it. Death. Pastor, it's kind, of, it's kind of heavy. It's kind of hard, I know. And it creates a hole when we see it. But there is a remedy. There is a medicine. Population Reference Bureau, PRB.org, claims that there are 108 billion people who have walked the earth since 8,000 BC. And there are currently 7.5 billion people on the earth today. That means that 100 billion people have died How many of those people do you remember? Who is the one person that has seemed to sweep the earth with popularity? Why is it that at his name, so many people know and understand in their language? Jesus the Christ? How did he get so popular? James, Dr. James Allen Francis wrote this in 1926 says this about the Lord Jesus. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30 when public opinion turned against him. He never wrote a book. 
He never held an office. He never went to college. He never visited a big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from where he was born. He did none of the things usually associated with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 years old and only was public in the public eye for three years. His friends ran away from him. One of them denied him. He was, overturned to, over, he was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves, criminals. While dying, his executioners gambled for his clothes, the only property that he had on the earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Those are the facts of his human life. Then he rose from the dead. 19 centuries, or we should say 20, have come and gone. And today, Jesus is the central figure of the human race. And the leader of mankind's progress, all the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever sailed, all the parliaments that have ever sat, all the kings that have reigned put together have not affected the life of mankind on the earth as powerful as this one solitary life. What did Jesus do that has affected the human race so greatly? Why is he so famous? He did the one thing that no human can do. He rose from the dead. Now, if we found out a guy rose from the dead, this news would spread very fast, and people would be all over this trying to figure out what exactly happened. What sets Jesus apart from all the hundred billion people to have come and died, is that he rose from the dead. He conquered the greatest issue in the human race. Not only did he conquer it, he then walked around the earth for another 40 days, showing everyone in the city that he was alive. And he promised those who believed in his resurrection that he would bring resurrection to them as well. And his message and followers has spread 2,000 years now, and we're talking about it here today. Something happened on that day. How do you lose Jesus Christ's body? How do you, why can't you find that thing? This figure, you can't find him, his following there in that region. What happened? We have disciples going to the grave, all of his friends, all of the guys closest to him being tortured and put to death, all saying, look, trust me, he really rose from the dead. You think in their last minute they would have said, dude, it's just a big spoof, man. We're just punking you right now. Like, it didn't really happen. We're just messing with you. Don't put us to death and torture us. No, every single one of them go to the death saying it was true. There were 500 witnesses at one time who said it was true. How many witnesses has it taken a court of law to say something is true? There's a lot of people who saw this and it spread through the land. And then it went beyond that. Not only a physical resurrection, but his message for some reason was resurrecting people from the inside out. Jesus promised resurrection to the world, and that is what we need. I want to talk about that here today. I want you to see it. What does that have to do with me? How does this affect my life? Where is the hope found in this? Let's take a look at his resurrection now. We're going to be in Luke chapter 24 reading in verse 1. Would you stand for the reading of God's word with me, please? Let's look at the resurrection. We stand for the reading of God's word to give honor to him, because it's his words and not mine. Luke chapter 24, verse 1, take a look. Now on the first day of the week, that's Sunday, very early in the morning, that'd be before 6 a.m., they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found that the stone rolled away from the tomb, But they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day will rise again. And they remembered his words. Verse 9, Then they returned to the tomb and told all these things to the eleven disciples and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. 
And their words seemed to, be, to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb and stood down. He saw the linen cloths laying by themselves and departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Let's pray. Father, as we look at the resurrection, I pray that you would raise us to life, that we would see the power in the resurrection, what Jesus has promised us, and that we would raise to new life, that we would walk with you in a new way, that you would make old things pass away and everything become new, that those things would die and we would truly live. I pray that you'd bless us as we look at your word now. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. A few things to note. I'd like to just talk about the scriptures here. Take a look at the story. A few things to note. First, did you notice it was women who were with Jesus at the tomb with spices to prepare his body for the burial? Not men. Where are his disciples? Where are the boys? who have been hanging out with him for three years. Peter, James, John, where are you? They're over there moping in the corner. They forgot that Jesus told them he was going to raise from the dead. How do you forget that? Notice, Jesus allowed the news that he was alive to be placed in the hands of women who were suppressed in that society and culture. I don't know if you knew this, but Jesus is more pro-women than anyone on the earth. He entrusted them with his testimony, the testimony from the angels into their hands to go and tell his disciples. They were the first to know on the earth this group of women. Now, sometimes it gets a little bit out of control, no doubt, in our society, but Jesus is the only one who puts women in and exalts women, I should say, to their rightful place in society. Right here in the resurrection, it's hidden in our story. Just a little side note to you. That was a bonus, okay? Verse two, the stone was rolled away. Now, when we think of a tomb or we think of a, um, a funeral, we always bury people on the ground. But there, if you go to Israel today, right outside Jerusalem, outside the city walls there, I've been there, the place where they think Jesus actually rose from the dead is a tomb or a cave that was really carved out of the rock. And it's kind of like this little cave that you walk into. And the door would really only be about this big. What they would do is they would, they would break it open and they would do all the work and then they would fill in the rest and they would roll a stone that has kind of a gutter here and it would roll over the door and the entrance of the tomb. When the women showed up with the spices to prepare his body for burial, the, the stone was rolled away. It was open. They're like, who messed with the tomb? They were troubled, wondering what had happened, and the angels then show up. I could see the angels maybe sitting on the, uh, the, the, the giant uh, door of the tomb there, the stone. Hey, what are you doing? It says in the text they bowed down because they saw a spiritual being, and they didn't know what to do. But the angels say this, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's alive. Verse 6, he is not here, but he is risen. If you go to the tomb in Jerusalem, there right outside the city, it's in a garden. There's a cistern under the garden. It's a 2,000-year-old tomb. And they put there on the entrance of the door, he is not here for he has risen. Christ risen from the dead. The angel said to the girls, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and then the third day rise again. Remember? Remember? And it says there in verse 8, they remembered. Jesus foretold his death and resurrection before it happened. Did you know that? He spoke about it. He was talking about it all the time. I must be handed over. I must die and then rise from the dead. And still, once it happened, everybody's scratching their head. When the Son of God, when Jesus the King is doing miracles all over the city, his fame was spreading throughout the land. Then all of a sudden, Pontius Pilate rises up and really meets the demands of the people because he wants their favor and says, all right, put him to death. They go and take this guy who was ministering, loving, and serving everyone in the city, and they nail him to a cross. They beat him bloody. They nail him to a cross, and they leave him out there like a criminal to die. 
And everybody is flipping out in the city, all of the disciples, all the followers of Jesus, because they're like, our guy, our king, the political leader that we thought was going to change our nation, the one who was going to save us is being put to death. So they forgot everything that he told them because they were in such panic and they fled and hid. But it was planned. Do you know this was planned even before Jesus was born? Yeah, your Bible tells you in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, she will bear a son, that's Mary, the mother of Jesus, and you will call his name, you're, you're going to have a son, and you're going to call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Hey, Mary, I want you to know you need to call his name Jesus. She didn't get to pick the name. God picked it for her. Jesus, but his name is salvation. His name means Yeshua. His name means the Lord is salvation. In his name was salvation. And it was planned when that baby was born that that baby would grow up and become a man and he would die for the sins of the world to resurrect the earth and bring it back to the place that God had planned for it to be. We have drifted. We have drifted very far from God's plan as a nation, as a people. God bless America, I hope. Because we have a lot of the nation saying that they are Christian, but running from God. We have a lot of people who are okay with Jesus, but love their sin. You see, Jesus came to the earth with a mission to save and serve people. He told us that in Mark 10, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. So after the angels tell the women, and they remember, they ran and told the boys. Disciples, Peter, James, John, you'll never believe it. The, the stone's been rolled away. Jesus has risen from the dead. His body's not there. We can't find him anywhere. And the boys looking at us like, oh, I don't know if we're going to listen to the women. Shame on you guys. Ladies, isn't that how it is? Men just don't listen, do they? 2,000-year-old truth right here. <laughs> just don't listen. They didn't listen. One guy did. His name's Peter. Peter, the big, burly fisherman. He, he's like, what? Jesus rose. Are you serious? It says he starts running to the tomb to go see <clears throat> what had happened. And he stooped down and he looked in the tomb. And when he saw the linen was gone, and that Jesus wasn't there, it says that he marveled. Now, this is a fun little trick here. So that's um, in, in the gospel of Luke here. That's, Luke is a doctor and Luke is a, also a historian. He is writing down uh, all of the things that happened there in Jesus' time. Dr. Luke is writing these things. But also, the Apostle John wrote down his version. These are the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. He wrote down his version of what happened. And as John was writing it, do you know what John wrote? Listen, there's a little bit, little funny humor in here. It says, John's Gospel says, Peter therefore went out. Yeah, he started running. And the other disciple... We're going to the tomb. So they both ran together. This is John and Peter. They both ran together, verse 4 says, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. <laughs> John? What, what, what's that for? Well, I just, you know, I, that's really what happened, so I have to write it in there, you know? <laughs> got be, to be historically accurate, you know? He wrote in there that he beat Peter to the tomb. This is hilarious. Because Peter, if you remember, Peter is the very extroverted disciple. He is very forward-thinking, positive, just plow forward, doesn't think sometimes, and just jumps off the cliff. John is a very calm and collected, the cautious one. It's funny that he says, I beat Peter. We have to remember where the disciples come, are coming from. First off, remember, they were just like the rest of the Jews that Jesus was going to establish a big political kingdom. The Jewish people wanted a political king who would overthrow the Romans and lead them to the promised time. Lead them to a place of prosperity and peace in their land. They were suppressed by the Roman government. So the Jewish people wanted a political leader, so did the disciples. That he would be a king and rule and reign and they were not expecting Jesus to die. They were not expecting to lose their best friend, their leader and their Messiah. They were devastated. They were sad. They were crushed. They watched him be crucified, tortured. And that is a very hard thing to watch. And it played over and over and over in their heads over the next few days. 
Not only did their best friend and leader die, he was the best person to ever walk the earth. Can you imagine being friends with that guy? The best person to ever walk the earth. Can you imagine losing that friend, that family member, that leader, that king? He's put to death like a criminal at 33 years old. The disciples must have been thinking, do you realize what you have done, people? You just killed the great leader. You just killed the one who heals the sick. You just killed the one who is loving people like we've never seen. But can you imagine, church, legacy, listen up. Can you imagine three of the darkest days of depression and worry, and all of a sudden, it's true. The Lord, what the Lord said was true. The tomb is empty. Where is Jesus? Jesus is alive. Peter must have started freaking out and running around. He is alive, just like what he said. He's alive. It's an amazing picture. It's an amazing time of excitement for the city. Many times when we think of Easter and the resurrection of Jesus, we don't understand the implications of it. He really did rise from the dead. Jesus rose and conquered something that we can't. It's a miracle for sure, but what does that have to do with us? And what's so important about it? Let me give you three reasons why the resurrection of Jesus is the greatest day in all of history. Three reasons I want you to walk away with. Number one, our greatest need. The reason that Jesus rose from the dead, is that it proves everything he ever said. Now watch this. If a guy says he's going to raise from the dead and says a bunch of radical things about himself and about eternity, you're going to question it. But then if he says, I'm going to prove it to you by raising from the dead, you're like, okay, try to pull that magic trick off. We'll be watching. And he does. That sends a signal. That settles the argument of truth. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great preacher, said, the resurrection is a fact better attested than any event recorded in any history, whether ancient or modern. The great writer C.S. Lewis says, Jesus has forced open a door that has been locked since the death of the first man. He has met, fought, and beaten the king of death. Everything is different because he has done so. In his resurrection, Christ proved what he came to do. The Jews in that day even asked him, they said in John chapter 2, what sign do you show us for doing these things? You know what he said? He said, destroy the temple and I will raise it up again in three days. And the Jews come to say, what are you talking about? The temple took 40 years to build. You're not going to raise that thing in three days if it is destroyed. And then Jesus says, the temple he was speaking about was his own body. Destroy this temple and I will raise it in three days. That is the sign that I give you that Christianity is true. That is the sign that I give you that all that I say is true. The resurrection is the center of Christianity. Without its proof, Christianity is not true. Jesus is dead and everything he said was bogus. We should throw Christianity away if Christ did not really raise from the dead, okay? If you're a skeptic or an atheist and you want to research or disprove something in Christianity, the resurrection is the perfect thing to disprove because our entire faith hinges on this truth. If he did not rise from the dead, we will not rise from the dead. We do not have hope. We do not have new life and we will not go to heaven when we die. But if he did rise from the dead, Everything he said was true. I'm not going to get to jump into all the proofs for it right now, but I want to send you to two different things. Number one, there is a movie that just came out called The Case for Christ. It just came out in theaters, and this is a case. This is Lee Strobel, who was a researcher for the Chicago Tribune, and it was his job to go and sift out problems in different cases. And so he went after the resurrection of Jesus Christ and he studied and studied and studied, went after all the historical documents, put everything together, tried to disprove this thing. And that's what the whole movie's about. The case for Christ, I'd encourage you to check it out. 
The second thing is, I actually had it in my notes, but I cut it all out because I can't bore you with all the facts today. But if you want to, I will email you, you email me, and I will email you all of my notes and give you the proofs right there, okay? Josh at LegacyCityChurch.com. Josh at LegacyCityChurch.com. I'd love to email it to you. But I want to tell you, even if you have the proof that Christ rose from the dead, you still have to believe that he forgives you of his, your sins. You can have all the proof sitting right in front of you. You know how I many miracles he did in front of people's eyes, and they still didn't follow him. What does it take? Show me, then I'll believe. I don't know. How many more miracles do you need in your life? What more do you need to see? What is the meaning of the resurrection? Number one, it's a proof for Christianity. Number two, it's eternity. The resurrection raises you to heaven. Jesus talked about heaven being a real place. Either he was a liar and a lunatic or he was really speaking the truth. He talked about a place where God will judge all living beings. All human beings will stand before the Lord. No one's getting away with anything on the earth. Everyone will have to stand before the Almighty. It's a real place. But the resurrection of Christ brings good news, church. That's the good news. The bad news is what Christ had to go through to bring us the resurrection. We just celebrated Good Friday, right? The only reason Friday is good or Good Friday is good is because of the bad day that Jesus had. You know what happened on Good Friday? Jesus took the full punishment of our sins on the cross so that we could go free before God. Do you know sin can't go unpunished? Look, in a court of law, if someone has done wrong and they stand before the judge, we all want that person to be convicted because that's the right thing to do. Here's the problem. If God is a great judge in the heavens, and if we have done wrong before him and we stand before him one day and all of our dirt comes before him, justice would say that we should be found guilty and we will be found guilty. The Bible says that all people fall short of the glory of God. Me too. Every single person has not met God's standards. He doesn't grade on a curve. I go, I'm a good person compared to what? Compared to God who is perfect, we are all not able to make it to heaven. So we need somebody to step in the gap. You see, back in the Garden of Eden, Adam was with God. God made man and woman to be with him and to enjoy the earth. He says, here's the playground, enjoy. Walk with me, worship me, enjoy. Why does God command us to worship him? Is it because he's a big guy in the sky who needs a massage every once in a while? No. You know why he commands you to worship? Because you were made to worship him. You need to do so in order to, in order to enjoy the highest levels of joy, rest, and peace in life. A car is made to run on gas. If you put gasoline in the car, it will run great. If you put dirt in the gasoline tank, it will not run. You know what, we, what we, we were made to run on? We were made to run on the worship of God, to enjoy him. Think about this. If you were really made to worship him, worshiping anything else on the earth will leave you sick. Your car will not run. It won't work. You were made to fellowship with the Almighty and enjoy the earth that he created for you. But here are human beings who have sinned against God, separated the relationship, running around on the earth, trying to figure out what we're supposed to be doing hating and hurting each other, elbowing down. I'm going to step on you so I can get higher. I'm just going to use and abuse. We're just always trying to worship self. We weren't made to worship ourselves. We were made to worship him. Jesus made a way for us to get back to God. We broke off the relationship with sin. Jesus came down to die for that sin so that our sin can be forgiven. And now we can come back into relationship with God. What we were made to do you're made to love God and love people. That is your mission on the earth. Not make money, not try to be successful, not get degrees, not buy houses and multiply material things. All those things are great. I like my jacket, it's nice. I like my Apple Watch, it's really nice. It's a first generation one, but I like it, it's great. I enjoy technology, but we're not to worship this stuff. This is not our God. This jacket can do nothing for me. It keeps me warm for a little bit, makes me look sharp for a little bit, 
But man, it does nothing for my heart and soul that aches and cries out to worship and enjoy the Almighty. That is what the earth is crying for. That is what people need to do. They need to get close to their God. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Because we've sinned against God, God says, here's your paycheck. You want your wages? It's death. That's the punishment. We will die. But the verse doesn't stop there. The gift, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. After being buried three days, Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday morning. On this day, 2,000 years ago, the first day of the week, he rose from the dead. In the future, I hope church will be able to do a sunrise service. Would LA be able to do that? Are we, are we good for that? Like, I don't know. Like, are we talking like 5.30 and stuff? That's pretty early. We do 5.30 every morning just to beat the traffic, and we got to do it on a Sunday. It would be fantastic. Maybe, maybe in maybe three, four, or five years, we find an amphitheater here in the city. We come together and worship. We watch the sunrise and we celebrate the resurrection. The moment 2,000 years ago, as the sun rose, Christ was rising from the dead. Jesus said this. If you haven't heard anything, I want you to hear this. John eleven twenty-five. 25, Jesus says this to you. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he dies, even though he will die or she will die, they will live. If you believe in me, he says, you will live. My younger brother passed away just two years ago. The second oldest, I'm the oldest of three boys. Jacob passed away two years ago and he actually was worshiping here on this stage with us. He plays piano. And he was worshiping here with us on Sunday, that Sunday, and on Tuesday, he was gone. If the resurrection is not true, then he is dead, and I will never see him again. Let's be honest. We say things like rest in peace, and hopefully I'll see you on the other side. Will we? Or are we just fluffing each other up to make each other feel better? I need a real hope. I need something that is going to guarantee that I will see him again one day. And if it is true, the resurrection is true, then my brother has already raised from the dead and I will see him soon. My mother died when I was six years old. Dad left with three boys, raising his family. If the resurrection is not true, I will not see her ever again. If the resurrection is true, I will see her again. My grandfather died just two years ago as well, and I will see him again soon. Without the resurrection, there is no hope. Humans just die, and that's it. There is no purpose to this life. We just get survival of the fittest status and just start hammering each other down to see who can get to the top, suppress one another, hurt one another, dictate one another so that I can be greater and I can survive on if there is something beyond that, we have something greater to hope for, something that gives me real peace today, that I will see my brother again one day, that death does not have the last say, that even when I die, I will live. And I look forward to that because this body is just all right. I'm, I'm, I'm 34 years old and my hair's already gone. Come on. I'm telling you, if you want to find me in heaven, just look for the guy with the afro out to here, all right? I'm just going to be like... Yeah, what now? See, you, you were clowning me on earth, but look at me now. I used to have locks. I loved to surf, and I used to, I actually whipped, you know, my hair in the wind, and so I actually did that. I, I had a wave. I really did. I had a wave right here. Now all I have is beach, right? All I have is beach, right? Thank you. <laughs> I need the resurrection to be true. Not only do I need it to be true, it is true. And that's why Jesus has impacted thousands upon millions of people to walk the earth. My final point, what is the meaning of the resurrection? It is life. The resurrection not only promises life in eternity, it promises me life now. Now, 
a spiritual resurrection, a new mind, a new heart, ripping out the heart of stone and giving a heart of flesh. Jesus said in John 10.10, the thief or the enemy, the dark spirits of this world come to steal from you, kill you, and destroy you. And they are real. And they are here in this city, no doubt. I've seen some pretty crazy stuff. What influences people behind the scenes to do these wicked things to one another? How in the world can they do this? He says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus says, I have come to give you life and give it abundantly. Not only did Jesus rise from the dead so that one day you can be raised from the dead when you die and go to heaven, but also that you would be raised from the dead to life now, in this life, here on earth. He has come to give you life more abundantly, more life than you've ever experienced. Jesus said in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one will get to God but through me. Jesus said that. That's a crazy statement. No one's getting to God unless through him. Jesus said that. Now either he's a liar and a crazy or he was really telling the truth. You can't just say stuff like that. Jesus wants to give you true life here on this earth. And I mean a life of meaning and purpose, a life of blessings and salvation, a life of joy, peace, and rest. God has a specific way of life that brings peace to human beings. And here we are running around on the earth, not listening to what God says, but doing our own thing and hurting each other greatly. It is really sad what's going on in our nation and what's going on in the world today, isn't it? Why can't humans learn? We got iPhones in our pockets, little computers in our pockets, but we can't learn to love and serve each other. What's wrong with us? Why can't we learn from history? Because there's a problem inside of us. We have bad hearts. We had bad minds. It doesn't matter how much you influence people. If they don't get a new heart and a new mind, they're not changing. They're not changing. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy from you, and I feel maybe if you might feel that way today. Now in life, life has not been going well. You may maybe have made lots of problems for yourself or have been running from God, and you feel the weight of all of that tearing you down, stealing the joy, stealing the peace, stealing the rest. You know that gas tank is craving a relationship with God. So that engine will run on all cylinders. God wants you in close relationship with him, and that is what the resurrection of Christ does. God wants to resurrect your life today. There's no greater way to celebrate Easter and Resurrection Day than to give your life over to God in resurrection. I'll never forget the day that I was raised to life. Look at me. What am I doing out here? What, why have I given my whole life over to this? They say that a pastor carries the stress of a doctor. Uh, I'm sorry, the stress of a lawyer gets the, use, uh, works the time of a doctor but doesn't get paid like either, right? <laughs> why would you give your life over and be preaching and trying to minister, love, and serve people on the earth. I'll tell you why. Because God changed my life from the inside out. One day I was running from him, running in my own sin, living in my own ways. And I'd been seeking and wondering, and one day he came in and changed me from the inside out. It changed everything. Why do I have desires to love and serve people now like I never had before? Why am I convicted? when I do wrong? Why do I have these desires inside of me? They came from God and he raised me to life and I wouldn't trade it for the world. The world needs Jesus. Maybe you're saying, what must I do to be saved from my sins and forgiven by God? Let me tell you this. We need forgiveness. We need things to be made right with God. And I want to give you the message. This is it. It's very simple. You must recognize that God is the creator, that he owns everything. The Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and all that contains it. You must realize that God is perfectly holy. A judge requires perfect obedience from humans. We say, well, I can't do that. Nobody can. That's what Jesus is for. He stepped in the gap to build the bridge for you to God, did the work that we could never do so that we could be forgiven. We must see that we've broken God's commands. We've sinned before him, and we've messed up the relationship. 
but Jesus made a way for us to be brought back to him. We must realize that we can't save ourselves from good works, by good works. Well, I helped the old lady across the street. I opened doors. I went to church. I did good things. I'm good enough to get to heaven. No one is good enough. We need Christ to get us to heaven. We are all dependent upon him. No one is good enough. You have to teach a baby good or bad. You got to teach them good. They start doing bad as soon as they can start walking, right? As soon as they're talking. I mean, the first word, why do they learn no so quickly? No, no, no. I mean, they, they're just destructed, they're doing all kinds of things. You're like, I got to teach this child right. We start doing wrong since the day we are born, and we do a lot of wrong in our hearts here in L.A., for sure. God sees all of our wrong, but he's ready to forgive our wrong. The Bible says that God demonstrated his own love toward us. He loves you. God loves you. Family, and I believe that he has brought you here today maybe to hear that simple message. God loves you. He's not some angry dictator in the sky that just wants to squash everybody. If you just read the Bible, you'll see that very clearly. A lot of people have never read it. He is a God who loves his enemies pursues them, and saves them. And I don't know any God like that in the universe. Who turns to a thief who's being crucified on his left and says, hey, you believe my word? I know you've done a lot of wrong in your life, but I'm gonna tell you this, today you will be with me in paradise. That man dying, all the guilt and shame of his life in that moment, and Christ forgives him of everything. That is, is the God that we serve. And that is the God who changes our lives. What must we do to be saved? We need to, tu- don't miss this. We need to turn away from the sinful lifestyles that we have been living, running from God, and turn to God with all of our hearts. Nobody's perfect, but you're either pursuing away from God or you're pursuing to God. You make that decision. You need to make that choice. We must repent of our sin turn from a, and turn to God and start walking with him. Jesus said, if anyone wishes to come after me, you must deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. That's what it means to follow Christ. If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need would have been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness, and so God sent us a Savior. That's what we need. John 3.16 tells us, let me read this over you, please. For God so loved the world, that's you, that he gave his only begotten Son, that's Jesus, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but it will have everlasting life.